Good evening, and thank you for um, attending online uh, Caritas Consciousness Project. We're delighted this evening to have Stephen Hatch to present to you uh, the, his presentation, complete with gorgeous photographs of nature, uh, the wilderness mysticism of John Muir. Uh, Stephen Hatch trained with Father Thomas Keating in the 1980s and has lived a contemplative life ever since. His life work is discovering and practicing the connection between nature and contemplation. Stephen teaches two Christian mysticism courses at Naropa University and is the author of the contemplative John Muir, Spiritual Quotations from the Great American Naturalist. Uh, which was published in 2012, and Wilderness Mysticism, a Contemplative Christian Tradition, published in 2018. He was interviewed in the recent film, The Unruly Mystic, John Muir, in 2019. Uh, Stephen lives in Fort Collins and hikes, camps, and backpacks whenever he can. And I think you just got back from... Uh, a wilderness trip, John? Well, hi, everybody. Uh, it's, it's nice to be here tonight. Uh, the Zoom is a little bit of a different uh, format as for all of us. I had to just finish up my Naropa class with uh, Zoom. Uh, that was about uh, a third of the class session, so that was very interesting. Um, so I am going to share with you uh, one of the great passions of my life, which is the uh, mysticism of John Muir. Uh, but I'm going to give you a PowerPoint presentation that includes many of my own photos and kind of a, um, a history of John Muir and his spirituality as it applies to uh, where we're at now. So um, here's a picture of John Muir. Um, I have it on my desk as well. And um, I have been interested in him for a long time. So basically we're talking about mysticism and um, we're defining here mysticism as the direct experience of union with ultimate reality or God or the source, um, one that involves silence, solitude, simplicity, and other contemplative disciplines. And so wilderness mysticism, which is a term that I've come up with over the, about the ten, past 10 years, is where, where nature is the primary place of revelation and the locus for this union practiced in mysticism. And in America, Christian spirituality has for many modern seekers morphed into a kind of wilderness mysticism. Um, and for many people, as you, many of you, I'm sure included, um, the natural world is your church or your community. Now, John Muir was originally from Scotland. So uh, <clears throat> as a Scot, he had Celtic Christianity in his background and the Celtic Christianity has survived in the Scottish islands of the Outer Hebrides after it was suppressed by the Roman church. And here's just an example of a Celtic poem. This would have been running through uh, Muir's blood. And this one is um, from the early Middle Ages. I am the wind that breathes upon the sea. I am the wave on the ocean. I'm the murmur of the leaves rustling. I am the rays of the sun. I am the beam of the moon and stars. I am the power of the trees growing. I am the bud breaking into blossom. I am the movement of the salmon swimming. I am the courage of the wild boar fighting. I am the speed of the stag running. I am the strength of the ox pulling the plow. I am the size of the mighty oak tree. And I am the thoughts of all the people who praise my beauty and grace. What I love here is God is often an adjective or an adverb uh, or a verb rather than a noun. So this would have been in Muir's background. And here is Dunbar, Scotland, uh, where he grew up um, until about the age of 11. And he liked to climb on the cliffs here. And uh, there was an old castle that he liked to explore. And um, it was a paradise for him. Um, here's another Ninian's Catechism from the early 5th century, where the question is, what are the f is the fruit of study? And the answer is to perceive the eternal word of God reflected in every plant and insect, every bird and animal, 
and in every man and woman. So the Celtic Christian tradition is really focused on that ability to see the word of God in the second scripture of nature. And of course, there are several modern uh, writers who you might know. John O'Donohue um, is one of them who are trying to bring this approach back. So John Muir, um, in a statement, he says, Christianity and mountain entity, a, a word he made up here, are streams from the same fountain. In God's wildness lies the hope of the world. In one of his journals, he signed it, John Muir, Earth, Planet, Universe. So as you can see, he was born in 1838 and uh, died just on the eve of World War I beginning. So here is just a basic um, uh, summary of his, his life so that you have that as a backdrop um, as we talk about these different spiritual um, insights that Muir had. So he was born in 1838 in Scotland. And then one day at age 11, his dad finally says, uh, we are moving to uh, Wisconsin, to America in the morning. So the whole family of, I believe, uh, six packed up and went on the ship and um, went to Wisconsin where they had some land that they farmed. And John was um, the oldest, and the dad was really quite, um, he was quite a child abuser, really. He would beat uh, John uh, quite frequently. So he finally left home then. Uh, he was an inventor, uh, and he left home to show his inventions at the State Agricultural Fair in Madison. Um, and then he studied botany and geology there, where he met a lifelong friend, the wife of a professor, uh, Jean Carr. And then he worked and traveled in Ontario, Canada. Some say it was to escape the Civil War draft, uh, but that's really not known. And then he had a life-changing event uh, when he was filing a, uh, he was uh, taking care of a file in the factory one day. It slipped and hit his eye, the pointed it. Uh, edge of it hit his eye and made him temporarily blind. And while he was in that state, he realized, you know what, I don't want to study the inventions of humans anymore. I want to study the inventions of God. So uh, he was really quite successful in his job as an inventor and in the factories, and he left all that. Uh, as he said in one passage, I could have become a millionaire, but I chose to become a tramp. So uh, just after the Civil War, he did a thousand mile walk to the Gulf of Mexico down to Florida, where he contracted malaria and he almost died. And in that state of delirium um, and high fever, he had some mystical experiences of the oneness of all things, uh, very similar to what uh, happens in a lot of the lives of many shamans. Um, he moved to California. He had seen something about Yosemite being an amazing place. Um, so he visited there for the first time, and uh, he had a kind of a born-again experience, which we'll talk about, in the Sierra Nevada mountains, um, and he took a sheep herding job that first summer. His famous book is My First Summer in the Sierra. Um, then he lived in Yosemite Valley, worked in a sawmill that uh, processed dead trees, and he explored the Sierra on his uh, free time. Uh, then he succeeded in uh, going on a whole series of explorations to California, Utah, Nevada, and Alaska. And in the winters, he wrote uh, articles about conservation and preserving these wild places. Finally, at age 41, he married Louis Wanda Strenzel, and uh, she was the daughter of a Polish immigrant, and he had uh, orchards in Martinez, California, and Muir managed those. Uh, <clears throat> many historians call these his lost years because he became something of a workaholic, and uh, she, uh, his wife was realizing this wasn't the man that she had married. Uh, and after the two daughters were born, and as they were raising them, she secretly uh, arranged for him to go on a camping trip to Washington and Oregon with some friends um, so he could get in touch with the wilds again, which was, uh, that was the man that she had married who was passionate about the wilderness. Um, and he had a kind of another born again experience at Rainier of mystical oneness with the earth. Uh, 
Later then, he camped at Yosemite. He brought the editor of the Century magazine, um, which was a very prominent magazine at the time. And uh, the, the editor wanted to see what was happening in these different wild areas in California, especially in uh, the Yosemite. And together, uh, Muir took uh, the editor to places that he visited when he was a younger man, and he saw that they were being destroyed. They were uh, being mined, they were being logged, the sheep were overrunning everything. So he started writing and campaigning uh, for wilderness preservation and wrote many articles for the Century magazine. And then, of course, his famous, uh, his, his famous camping trip with Teddy Roosevelt, where he pummeled Roosevelt with stories about uh, what was happening to the Sierra and the Yosemite. And <clears throat> so Roosevelt, of course, um, was the major force for conservation. He had John Muir speaking in one ear and uh, sort of the National Park Service for preservation of wild areas. In the other ear, he had Gifford Pinchot, who uh, had a multiple use uh, approach. In other words, logging, timbering, recreation, grazing. And so the U.S. Forest Service started then. So both the National Park Service committed to uh, preservation and the U.S. Forest Service committed to multiple use conservation started uh, during this time um, that Roosevelt met with Muir. Um, and then uh, World War I began when he was age 76 and he died of pneumonia uh, on uh, December 24th, just before the war started. Um, so are there any questions about that little rundown of his life, just so you get an idea of some of the major events of his life? Uh, I don't have a question, but I do have something I want to say real quick. Um, those of you attending the broadcast, if you would mute your microphones, except when you want to ask a question, of course, uh, because any extraneous noise interrupts the talk. So, Edna, uh, would you please mute your microphone? I'm still trying to get connected. No, you're connected. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Uh, sorry. Sorry, Stephen. I just didn't want a lot of extraneous noise. That's okay. Okay. Uh, so here I am as a little boy. Um, a couple of years after this was taken out, see, I was in first grade here. In third grade, you know how we had those readers in school with a bunch of stories? Uh, when I was in third grade, um, there was a, uh, a story about a little dog named Stikeen. I got real interested in geology and, uh, and I wanted to become a geologist and a paleontologist when I got bigger, but Muir was affecting me at this time. And the, uh, the story Stikeen about a dog that followed Muir across a a dangerous uh, crevasse up in Alaska um, really won my heart. Um, in that story, he realized that, that animals have souls as well. It isn't just humans. And that was something that would carry on for him for the rest of his life. Um, there he is in later life with uh, a dog. Uh, I often feel that I'm kind of a uh, living John Muir. I follow in his footsteps and I often imagine that I am him. Uh, actually, I was at Yosemite at the Visitor Center one day and I uh, stood behind this uh, and uh, somebody snapped a picture. So uh, he's been a major force in my life. Here's John Muir sitting on the edge of a cliff overlooking Yosemite Falls. That was definitely his place of uh, baptism and of his conversion experience to a oneness with the divine through nature. And for me, too, this is, was one of Muir's favorite haunts. Uh, this is Lower Cathedral Lake, and that's Cathedral Peak. Um, I, too, find that it's a place where I'm ecstatic. Yosemite, of course, is this incredible place that has, this is Half Dome, uh, these gleaming white granite, granites. Muir said that it should be actually called not the Sierra Nevada, but the Range of Light. And here's some shooting stars that are blooming in Tuolumne Meadows, um, another of Muir's favorite places to camp at Yosemite. 
in the 1860s. Of course, if you visit now, this is what you're going to see a lot of the time. Why do you suppose the, uh, there's this orange glow? Pollution? Uh, no, it's forest fire. <gasps> yeah, probably two-thirds of the time that I've been there in the past 10 years, there's a forest fire raging at the time. Uh, the new reality in the West. It made for a stunning photography, for sure. Uh, and here's also the orange glow at Cathedral Peak. Uh, this is, was another of Muir's favorite places in the Sierra. So what I did was I went back to his journals, which I found on microfilm um, at the local uh, university library, and I wanted to uncover his spirituality. A lot of the spirituality uh, that he practiced didn't make it into his published works, but it's in his journals. And um, so now we have all of these on the internet and the John Muir papers on the Sierra Club site. But I went through all of these to look for uh, passages that he, um, where he talked about his spirituality and his uh, experience of oneness with nature. And in my book, The Contemplative John Muir, about a quarter of those passages in there um, had never been uh, published before. So here example is a, a page of his, uh, as you can see, he's, he's talking about the mountains. And then he says, you are secure from intrusion, secure from yourself and your hard restricting shell of individuality is at once dissolved as when you gaze into the vistas of a sunset. Yet everything about you is beating warm with fountain human love and seems delightfully substantial and familiar. So he has this kind of mystical experience of when he loses himself into, um, uh, in this case, it was a mountain meadow. And at the same time, he loses himself paradoxically, everything is breathing love to him. So he was a very interesting guy. I would think of him as kind of a Renaissance man. Uh, he was a mystic. He was a scientist. He was a poet. He was a pragmatic man. Um, so what you get in his journals is you'll get sketches like this. Uh, where he's, he's trying to discover um, how the, the Sierra were formed. And um, he discovers it was through glaciation. Uh, so here's a sketch. And then in the very next page, he'll have some mystical reflections next to his, his sketches here. Uh, he talks about finding the beauty that's in yourself when you're in the beauty of the landscape. So he'll have a mystical reflection right after sketches. And then after that, he'll have... Um, measurements here where he is uh, trying to figure out what the elevation is and everything. So he's back to some scientific measurements and then he's back to some more sketches. Um, and here he's talking about what direction the wind is coming from and everything. Some of it is illegible. So he's really fascinating how he puts together the mystical and the scientific, uh, the pragmatic and the practical head and heart uh, all into one. So it makes his journals really fascinating reading. Here's another, you've got, he's, he's got arrows there. He was the first one to theorize that Yosemite Valley was formed through glaciation. And he did this by, he says he would wear tough gray clothes and lie on the granite and try to imagine how they were formed. And um, at the time, the California state geologist, this is Josiah Whitney, after whom Mount Whitney is named, had said that um, Yosemite Valley was formed through kind of a cataclysm where the whole valley dropped out. And Muir said, well, no, the evidence shows it was actually glaciers that carved it out. Well, Whitney got back to Muir and said, you're just an ignorant sheep herder. What do you know? Well, guess what? Muir was right. But part of it was because of this sort of mystical way he had of doing science, which was to imagine himself as the, as the glacier and to make himself one with the landscape. So in talking about his spirituality, there is a very fascinating aspect. A lot of people don't realize this, but there have been several uh, uh, important scholars in our time, Mark Stoll and Belden Lane are two, that show how our value for wilderness, for wilderness preservation actually comes from Calvinism, uh, which uh, always gets a bad rap because we, we look at the negative aspects of it. As with everything, everything is a combination of light and shadow. That's something I try to teach my students in class. Um, and so we focus so much on the shadow of Calvinism without realizing that it actually gave us some amazing gifts. 
Um, so it's quite interesting. In a 1966 uh, lecture entitled The Historical Roots of Our Ecological Crisis, uh, this historian, Lynn White, had said that the uh, Christian worldview was the root cause of the ecological crisis. And this was just before, a couple years before the first Earth Day. He argued that the Judeo-Christian theology normalized the exploitation of the natural world and tried to dominate it. He did suggest St. Francis of Assisi as an alternative Christian uh, for va the valuation of nature. And of course, Francis of Assisi uh, saw everything as his brother and sister, brother, son, sister, moon, and, and so on. Uh, at the time, uh, the people that listened to White, well, it was the countercultural movement was going on, and people figured that whatever Muir was, he certainly couldn't be a Christian. Uh, he must have instead have been um, a, some kind of a Western Taoist or a pantheist or American Buddhist, but he definitely couldn't be a Christian because Christianity was viewed at that time um, in the popular mind as a purely destructive. Um, however, modern scholarship and my own research has revealed how actually there was an aspect of Protestant mysticism and Christian mysticism and even Calvinism that actually uh, brought us our modern value for wilderness. So John Muir's father, Daniel Muir, was a very strict, uh, he was a Calvinist preacher. He was in the Campbellite denomination, which is now the Disciples of Christ, which is far more progressive than it was in his time. And uh, it was kind of a dour religion of studying the Bible and feeling that we're basically evil. Uh, and so Daniel Muir uh, made John memorize the Bible. Uh, he uh, learned the entire New Testament and three quarters of the Hebrew Bible. Um, and every time he made a mistake in recitation, his father would beat him. And um, so it was a very challenging upbringing for John. However, uh, John's mother, Ann Muir, really tried to encourage him in his love of nature, which he developed from an early age in Scotland. Um, and she often would help moderate the strict influences of Daniel Muir and really encouraged her son to, uh, to follow his pursuits. So here's John Calvin, who of course was a reformer in uh, the late 16th century who knew Martin Luther and of course, people are used to thinking of just about his double predestination, some people damned to heaven, some people damned to hell, um, and the basic depravity of humanity. But they don't realize there's a whole nother side to his teaching. Um, and so as in everything else, we realize that reality is a lot more complex than we've made it. Uh, so for here, for example, uh, is a passage from Calvin where he talks about that to enjoy the sight of God, he has to come forth viewed in his clothing. That is to say, we must first cast our eyes upon the beautiful fabric of the world in which God wishes to be seen by us. So it's as though the whole natural world is enclosing God and God is within it. He says, correctly is this world called the mirror of divinity. By looking at the world, the faithful see sparks of his glory glittering in every created thing. It can be said reverently, provided it proceeds from a reverent mind, that nature is God. So uh, surprising words from John Calvin. And why not? He lived on the shores of Lake Geneva with Mont Blanc hovering uh, in the background, one of the highest peaks in the Alps. So it makes sense that he would value nature um, and not think that everything was purely fallen. Another person in this tradition, an English Calvinist who then came to America was of course, Jonathan Edwards. And he was responsible for turning Calvinism uh, more toward a mystical turn. Of course, Harvard University is a, uh, is a Puritan um, institution of higher learning. And in that whole area of New England, so Jonathan Edwards, uh, he made the whole creator God motif more mystical by speaking less of a creator-creation duality uh, where God makes the world like an artisan and more of a creator who exists as a sort of sun that radiates the creation outward like sunlight. Now we would have seen this in Neoplatonists like uh, Plotinus back in the uh, early part uh, before, uh, before Christ. So 
Jonathan Edwards continues this tradition, as many of the other Protestants do as well. He says that God is God and distinguished from all other beings and exalted above him, chiefly by divine beauty. Beauty in the world is a communication of God's beauty. The beauties of nature are really emanations of the excellency of God, sort of like, like uh, sunlight coming out from the sun. And when we're delighted with flowery meadows and gentle breezes of wind, we may consider that we see emanations of the sweet benevolence of the creator and so forth. We see that the creatures of nature are emanations of God's own knowledge, holiness, and joy. So Edwards bring this sort of mystical turn. Uh, so on the one hand, you know, he has a split personality like all of us do, different facets of our being. On the one hand, we know uh, Edwards for the sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. On the other hand, uh, all of Edwards' theology is about beauty. Uh, so, so it's just like us. We, have to, we all have two sides to us, which I think is what is absolutely fascinating about the human condition. Uh, so there's everything about beauty and this kind of emanation that would turn Puritanism, that is English Calvinism, uh, in a more mystical turn there in New England. And so John Muir, too, would say creation is all one outpour emanation from God like the sun radiating the sunlight. See, there's a much closer connection there than just sort of the human model of an artisan who stands separate from the thing that they're making. Another person who would have been influential in Muir's life is John Knox. So Sc Scottish Calvinism, of course, led to the Presbyterian tradition, and John Knox is at the root of that. And from Scottish Calvinist Presbyterian preacher John Knox, Muir inherited a fiery, thus saith the Lord kind of preaching. And that is really what the environmentalist tradition kind of inherited. Um, many, many of the uh, chief conservationists of our time um, and others like Edward Abbey and uh, David Brower and uh, others, uh, they have that kind of fiery, uh, fiery kind of preaching. that If we don't change our ways, this is what is going to happen to us. And it's interesting because that comes from Scottish Calvinism. Even if they left their, the faith of their childhood, as you know, uh, the, things you're, you're, the things that you're raised on stay with you, even if you think that you leave them. They're still a part of you. And the other thing that John Knox really emphasized was the chief sin is avarice or greed. Um, and so Muir really took up on this, this, this idea that, that being greedy uh, is something that is uh, evil. So here is a famous quote from John Muir. This is in our national parks, his book. Nature's sublime wonders, like anything else worthwhile, have always been subject to attack by despoiling gain seekers and mischief makers of every degree, from Satan to senators, eagerly trying to make everything immediately and selfishly commercial with schemes disguised, disguised in smug, smiling philanthropy. Thus, long ago, a few enterprising merchants utilized the Jerusalem temple as a place of business instead of a place of prayer, changing money, buying and selling. The modern temple destroyers, devotees of ravaging commercialism, seem to have a perfect contempt for nature, and instead of lifting their eyes to the god of the mountains, lift them to the almighty dollar. Damn Hetch Hetchy, as well damn for water tanks, the people's cathedrals and churches, for no holier temple has ever been consecrated by the heart of man. What he's referring to here uh, in Hetch Hetchy was this beautiful valley you can see there on the left in Yosemite. What happened was there was an earthquake in um, San Francisco, I think it was 1906, and um, the water mains snapped. But the people that wanted to provide more water for San Francisco anyway used it as an excuse to say that we need to uh, get some water from uh, this area in the National Park. This had never been done before, uh, this, this preserved area. They were going to dam it. And so what happened was uh, there was a big controversy. Muir tried to keep it from being dammed, but uh, it was nevertheless. And so there we see on the right the way it looks today. Um, it's not a place that you can hike. Um, and hardly boat in as well. Some say that this is what killed him um, the, when he lost the struggle to save Hetch Hetchy. However, uh, the, his conservation and preservation work went on. 
So for Edwards and the Puritans, humans are corrupted and nature is good. So there's this sense that for the Puritans and the other Calvinists, there's a sense that nature is basically pure and it's humans who have become destructive. So for example, Jonathan Edwards says, God's creatures are good and were made to, for us to serve God with and do not willingly subserve to any other purpose. And they groan when they are abused to purposes so directly contrary to their nature and end. That is when we just use them um, and pollute them. So uh, it's interesting. Uh, this is something I deal with a lot in my class in the 16th century in the Reformation. This idea that um, the human being is somehow innately evil. Um, I would argue that this came when self-consciousness turned back on itself to a heightened degree in the 16th century. Uh, we think of Martin Luther, who once spent six hour in the, hours in the confession booth talking about all the things that he'd done wrong. Um, and so I would argue that when consciousness is starting to turn back on itself and no longer being identified with society or a religious institution, the Catholic Church that is, people felt cut off from anything larger. As we know, everything goes in pendulum swings, right? So we have this in human development as well of the individual. First, you know, we identify with our uh, primary caregiver and then with our family and then our peer group. And sometime in late adolescence, we start to turn back on ourselves and um, we, we start to wonder, you know, what is the meaning of life? Who are we? And we all often become suicidal. It's a very difficult time. Well, the 16th century in uh, Europe was the beginning of this. If we look at that kind of cultural evolution where people are starting to go through a spiritual adolescence, where they're aware of this separate, isolated self. And um, so I argue that the reformers, Luther, Calvin, and others who were at this time, um, they were really talking about the ego self turned back on itself, and they were mistaking that for the true self. So consciousness started to turn back on itself in a heightened and individualistic and alienated way during this era. And um, so many then turned to nature to try to escape from this kind of alienation, this kind of uh, hyper self-awareness. And this led directly to the preservation movement, uh, with Muir led to turning to the temple of nature as a way to reconnect with God, because the individual self and its ego variety uh, was, was too difficult to face. And so many, including Jonathan Edwards, would go into the wilderness to commune with God. So what happened then was a philosopher, Rousseau, who also grew up in Geneva, Calvinist Geneva, altered this uh, position. Instead of having an evil humanity and a good nature, he said that humans were by nature good, but he says that through the herd mentality in society, that's where the problems come about. And of course, he's at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and the polluting of the landscape. And so basically what happened then was we had this realization that humanity is basically pure, but the modern industrial society is the corrupting influence that removes us from the beauty of nature. Like the Puritans, he recommended that lonely meditation, the study of nature, and the contemplation of the universe necessarily makes a solitary person strive continually for the author of all things. So he recommended that people spend time in nature to reconnect to their basic purity um, and to get away from the corrupting influences of the corporate industrial society. And John Muir espoused this view as well. He believed that the individual was basically pure but that, um, that the industrial society was the thing that was depraved. So he says, man, as he came from the hand of his maker, was poetic and good in both mind and body, but the gross heathen heathenism of civilization has generally destroyed nature and poetry and all that is spiritual. I'm tempted at times to adopt the Calvinistic doctrine of total depravity. And then talking about San Francisco, the city that he spent a lot of time in, there's not a perfectly sane person in San Francisco, he said. He thought that when we're all bottled up like rats in a cage, that, um, that, that we're not at our best. So he saw a sin as a societal thing, and he saw its cure in nature. So, for example, he took the teaching 
of the parable in Jesus, in Luke, where Jesus talked about uh, the seeds that fall among the weeds. And then he says, when the seeds come up, they're choked with cares and riches and the superficial pleasures of this life. And so Muir took up on that and said, few in these hot, dim, frictiony times are quite sane or free, choked with care. And he says they are choked by the weeds of care um, in the cities. So there's this sense that too many stresses and um, too many cares in life are what keeps us from uh, really being able to delve into our spirituality. This was the view here that John Muir had following Rousseau. So here's what he says, okay? Civilization has not much to brag about. It drives its victims in flocks, repressing the growth of individuality. Many come to the mountains for the very purpose of escaping from bondage. There are ropes enough in civilization. It seems one of the gravest faults of civilized life is that uniformity prevents separate development. The body politic, though at its best like a family or composite plant like a sunflower, is beaten into a kind of paste and constantly stirred. This is our, our life in society, right? With the media and sometimes social media, this constant stirring and, and sort of beating you into conformity, thus rendering perfect crystallization of individual character difficult or next to impossible. You have to have stillness and solitude for the crystals to develop. We're born in certain conventional enclosures and seldom develop sufficient natural wildness to jump and wriggle out of them like chickens dying in the shell. A labyrinth of winding and circular tracks have gradually been laid down, and we all, like sheep, are prone to follow one another age after age, hungry and begrimed, while the pure heavens shower down blessings in vain. If people were compelled on the pain of death to visit the mountains only once in a lifetime, those who discovered the universal beauty would return again and again to nature's enriching fountains, and thus many a vague longing and gnawing unrest would be satisfied. So he saw the antidote to uh, this kind of being beaten into a paste and constantly busy um, as this going away into the simpli simplicity of the natural world. So he said that thousands of tired, nerve-shaken, over-civilized people are beginning to find that going to the mountains is going home, that wildness is a necessity, and that the mountain parks and reservations are useful not only as fountains of timber and irrigating rivers, but as fountains of life. Awakening from the stupefying effects of the vice of over-industry and the deadly apathy of luxury, they are trying as best they can to mix and enrich their own little ongoings with those of nature and to get rid of rust and disease. Briskly venturing and roaming, some are washing off sins and cobweb cares of the devil spinning in all day storms on mountains, sauntering in rosiny pine woods or in gentian meadows, getting in touch with the nerves of Mother Earth, jumping from rock to rock, feeling the life of them, learning the songs of them, panting in whole-souled exercise, and rejoicing in deep, long-drawn breaths of pure wildness. So he saw nature as the place to go in order to heal what happens to us in society. Go to the snow flowers in winter, to the sunflowers in summer. Go up and away for life, be fleet. Now he tells of an experience when he was growing up on the farm. Once I was let down into a deep well into which choke damp carbonic, carbonic acid had settled and nearly lost my life. His dad in Wisconsin had sent him to dig this well, and he was chipping in this sandstone for day after day, and they would lo lower him down in a bucket until they finally reached, I think they reached water at 90 feet. So that one day when he was lowered in the bucket, there was carbonic acid in there that had settled over the night. And he said that the deeper that I was immersed in the invisible poison, the less capable I became of willing measures to escape from it. And in just this condition are those who doil, toil or dawdle or, or dissipate in crowded towns in the sinks of commerce and pleasure. So he's saying that we don't even realize that um, we're feeling afflicted until one day we realize that we're depressed. So are, are there any uh, thoughts or questions at this point? on that whole section? Hold on. Okay. I, I have a thought. Yeah. Um, 
you know, with the pandemic going on and um, just the economy crashing and all of that, I was thinking the other day about, you know, what could it mean? What does it represent symbolically? And um, what came to me is that we as human beings have an innate um, need for spiritual growth and not only spiritual growth but also emotional psychological growth in other words psych uh psycho spiritual growth right yes and that when we don't fulfill that need or when we don't even acknowledge or recognize that need it gets projected outward it gets externalized so that we think that we have to, that the economy always has to be growing. Right. And our business always has to be growing. <laughs> and we all, we always have to be accumulating, you know, more wealth or more power or, you know, yeah. it's, it's kind of like uh, projecting the shadow. Yeah, so that we Except see Except that what we're projecting, what we're externalizing is an actual human need a very a very real need that we have it's just that if we don't know that need is there we don't acknowledge it yeah. then it gets projected outward into the material world where it is becomes toxic so we're seeing our own inner our own inner disease uh, outward in the pandemic Anyone else have any thoughts? Well, I um, grew up in Northern California and spent time in uh, Yosemite and we camped as a family and so forth. And I could not agree with them more that it's, you know, nature is just uh, such a cleanser of, yeah. you know, internal and external health. And especially my sister and I now, our parents are gone, but the, you know, we've got to get out in nature on a regular basis or, you know, it, it just is it, such a cathartic, you know, area to be. And I really do wonder how city people who've never gone to the mountains or, you know, the wilderness, how they stay sane. <laughs> I, mean, I couldn't agree with them more. There's probably not one sane person in San Francisco. <laughs> That's not true. I know there are because, you know, they get out in nature too, but it is just a requirement. And I don't know, this is really resonating with me. <clears throat> yeah, I think, um, well, I mean, I've noticed I've, I've spent the past couple of weeks camping, you know, this whole thing with the pandemic, it just, uh, you, uh, it feels claustrophobic at times and it's hard to get a perspective and you look at the news, you know, and there's just, just a lot of negative, a lot of bad news. So I find, I find that it's out in the wilderness where I am able to find some perspective on it all to come back and be able to have something to offer then. And that of course is exactly what John Muir did. Um, as we'll see the first national parks were formed because they were viewed as temples as a place where you could find that spiritual nourishment. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think, <clears throat> and now more than ever, we need the natural world in whatever way that we find it. But I think it's interesting that you bring that up. Actually, Shelton Johnson, uh, who is a park ranger at Yosemite, he's also African-American. He regularly goes to Oakland and San Francisco and to the cities, to the inner city kids, especially black and Hispanic, who may not have been to national parks and um, has set up a program for them to come out to the national parks to experience some of that liberation. And he's quite eloquent. Uh, Shelton Johnson is his name. You can look him up. Um, he's got some YouTube videos. Okay, so there's a big um, confluence between Muir, Emerson, and Thoreau. Uh, Muir actually knew Emerson. And you remember I was just talking about the, the Puritans of New England. Well, of course, that's where Emerson and Thoreau lived. Uh, so there, the transcendentalism came directly out of that context. Uh, there's Ralph Waldo Emerson. And um, so he came out and um, spent some time with John Muir at Yosemite. Um, and Muir comments that Emerson was the most serene, majestic, sequoia-like soul I have ever met. 
The, secure, the Sierra I was sure wanted to see him, and he must not go before gathering them an interview by camping here. A tremendous sincerity was his. He was as sincere as the trees, and his eye sincere as the sun. So he really liked uh, Emerson, and Emerson really liked Muir. Something that a lot of people don't realize is that Ralph Waldo Emerson's transcendentalist philosophy was largely influenced by his aunt. When, um, when Ralph was, I believe it was 10, his father died of stomach cancer, and so his aunt, Mary Moody Emerson, came to live with them and help raise him. And actually, she is the one who taught him to go for solitary walks in the woods, to, taught him to see a spiritual perspective in nature, and she was a Puritan. She was a Calvinist. She was sort of on the cusp between the old Puritanism um, that was maybe world-denying and the new Puritanism um, that, that would morph into transcendentalism. So actually, he relies quite a bit on her journals and insights, even though he doesn't give her credit. She was actually a major figure in his life and hence in the environmental history of the United States. So transcendentalism is a philosophy that basically has a two-way mirroring between nature and the mind, right? So on the one hand, we have Emerson saying that every hour and change corresponds to and authorizes a different state of the mind, from breathless noon to grimace midnight. So in other words, everything in the natural world corresponds to something within us, and at the same time, it also, also authorizes that state of mind. He says, every natural fact is a symbol of some spiritual fact. Every appearance in nature corresponds to some state of mind, and that state of mind can only be described by presenting that natural appearance as its picture. So there's this kind of two-way mirroring. So Emerson and Thoreau emphasized the way in which nature embodies and mirrors qualities of the human soul. So, for example, for them, when you go to a mountain, you see the mountain mirrors back the dignity of the soul, okay? So it's like it's showing you your own soul. Muir uh, was, emphasized the flip side of transcendentalism. He talked about the ways in which the human soul embodies and mirrors the qualities of nature. So for him, for example, the human soul is a human expression of the dignity of a mountain. So for Emerson, the mountain is an expression of the dignity of the human, for Muir, um, the human is an expression of the dignity of the mountain. And that makes sense. Uh, uh, Emerson lived in the relatively tame East, and Muir lived in the wild, wildness of the West. But they're both true, but there's this difference of emphasis. And here's this common mirroring. I took this picture up at Lower Blue Lake in the San Juan Mountains in Colorado on a backpacking trip. Uh, so actually, it's really interesting to study when they disagree. Uh, so I, I had checked out from interlibrary loan from Yale University uh, some of uh, Emerson's books and then um, Muir's commentary and his side notes, you know. So for example, Emerson might say, <coughs> the beauty of nature must always seem unreal and mocking until it has human figures. So it says there are, need to be humans to make it meaningful. And Muir says it in the margins, no, God is in it. <laughs> Emerson says the trees are imperfect men and seem to bemoan their imprisonment rooted in the ground. Muir says no. Emerson says there is in the woods and waters a certain enticement and flattery uh, together with a failure to yield a present satisfaction. In other words, it beckons you but can't fulfill it totally. This disappointment is felt in every landscape. And Muir said no, in nature always we find more than we expect. So it's really interesting to see when he read his friend, how he disagreed. Now, of course, the other transcendentalist is Thoreau. When Thoreau lived at Walden Pond, that was Emerson's land, right? Um, in, in Massachusetts there. So we see the influence there. Um, Muir never met Thoreau. Um, Thoreau met, uh, he died earlier than Emerson did. But for example, in Thoreau's works, you see him say, for many years I was self-appointed inspector of snowstorms and rainstorms. And Muir says, I'm a self-appointed inspector of gorgeous cultures and glaciers. Uh, so Thoreau's gonna say, every experience of nature reduces itself to a mood of the mind. So like if you see something in nature that you think is beautiful, it's because there's an inner, inner kind of beauty. 
uh, or if there's something that feels peaceful in nature, it's because of your inner peace. Uh, Muir emphasized the other way around. He says, no, winter blows the fog out of our heads. Nature's not a mirror for the moods of the mind. Uh, see, he wanted to see that he was an expression of the mountain, whereas Thoreau would wanted to say the mountain was an expression of him. They're both true, but you can just see the difference in emphasis uh, between the two of these here. Uh, this is from one of uh, Thoreau's books that I had borrowed from Yale University. It's called A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers. Uh, so we have down here where Thoreau says, the most stupendous scenery ceases to be sublime when it becomes distinct. And the, imagined doesn't the imagination is no longer encouraged to exaggerate it. And then um, Muir comments on the side, no scenery is limited. And then he says, there's no need for exaggeration. <laughs> he says that uh, it's already uh, grand in its own way. So Emerson and Thoreau had a little bit more gentrified kind of nature back East. And Muir loved the wild landscapes of the West and saw that wildness as something that was divine. So here are two other people who were influences in Muir's life. One was Jean Carr and the other is Louis Wanda uh, Strenzel Muir. So this is Jean Carr. She was the wife of um, one of Muir's professors at the University of Wisconsin. And she took up, she had a real friendship with Muir. I think that she saw in Muir a person who could live out um, some of her dreams while she was um, as many women were in that time, sort of uh, had certain stereotyped roles. And so she would uh, send all sorts of geologists and literary figures his way um, to try to encourage his spiritual development. And uh, much of his development is dependent on her. And then she actually uh, came to visit him out west once. And so after he had the accident where he was blinded in, in one eye and then the other eye went temporarily blind, she wrote to him and said, Dear John, I've often in my heart wondered what God was training you for. He gave you the eye within the eye to see in all natural objects the realized ideas of his mind. He gave you pure tastes and the steady preference of whatsoever is most lovely and excellent. He has made you a more individualized existence that is common and by your very nature and organization removed you from common temptations. When you are disposed to feel hopeless, you may think Mrs. Carr believes fully in me, and she will while there is enough left of my body to hold my soul. Um, so she was very uh, constantly encouraging of Muir and a big influence in his life. She also uh, helped him with his spirituality as he was developing his own uh, mysticism that was more than just the Calvinism of his father. So this is a Baptist minister in, Wisconsin, uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, um, in the 1860s here. And she says, <clears throat> this is the church that um, Jean Carr attended, that Walter Brooks, the pastor, says there are spiritual existences which the material forms of nature clothe and conceal. I had a fancy that there's a universe of spiritual bodies and forms of which the material plant and animal are the exact counterparts in the physical world. There's a pre-existent spiritual body for every moss, lichen, and plant of every kind, and growth is a clothing upon of themselves by these spiritual beings. They gather from nature its substances to make themselves a garment exactly fitting their persons, and go through the process of life for the sake of adding the pleasures of activity to the sweet habitude of being. So you get the idea here, there's a, there, it's a kind of animism that there's a spiritual presence that then is um, clothed upon with these various types of uh, tissue. It's interesting, this is a Baptist minister. Uh, in the 19th century, there was a whole lot more uh, a variety of ways to see things um, in the people in the church than there is today. It's kind of sad to think of now. But the, anyway, so Muir is going to develop a kind of Christian animism where everything has a soul to it. And Walter Brooks here, um, as seen through Gene Carr, is very influential in that way. So Muir will say in his journal, what is higher and what is lower in nature? When a portion of spirit clothes itself with a sheet of lichen tissue, 
colored simply red or yellow or gray or black, we say that's a low form of life. Yet is it more or less radically divine than another portion of spirit that has gathered the garments of leaf and fairy flower and adorned them with all the colors of light? But we say the latter is a higher form. All of these varied forms, high and low, are simply portions of God radiated from him as a sun. There's the emanation. And made terrestrial by the clothes they wear and by modifications of a corresponding kind in the God essence itself. It is as if God were wearing the mountains upon him as common bones and flesh. So there is this realization in Muir that at the heart of every creature is spirit. And this was quite radical for a man in the Victorian era uh, to say something like this. He also was very influenced by uh, Jean Carr's, uh, she sent him some Hindu texts um, and a few Buddhist texts. So she was trying to educate him in many different ways. He doesn't say much about it, but she would send him these texts. The other person in his life that was very influential was uh, Louis Wanda Strenzel Muir. So this is the woman that uh, Muir would marry at age 41, and they would have two daughters together. Um, actually, it was Jean Carr that brought them together. Uh, Jean Carr made sure that John and Louis Wanda met, and they fell in love. And um, so there's the family. There she is, and he is, and there is um, Helen on the right, and Wanda on the left. Both of them would go on to uh, further his conservation work. So uh, when he was, he inherited the fruit orchard when he got married, uh, he became a workaholic for seven or eight years. Eventually his wife got tired of seeing that the man that she had met and fallen in love with was seen to be disappearing into the work. So she secretly arranged to have him go away on a trip, camping trip to Mount Rainier in Washington State. And um, that was where he got in touch with his wilderness leanings again. <coughs> if it wasn't for um, his wife, we may not have the same conservation movement that we have today. That's bare grass with Mount Rainier. Uh, so basically what happened was when he was away, she wrote him a letter and said, I've decided that I'm going to sell some of the land and lease the rest. You need to be free to be in the wilderness and do your work there. So because of uh, Louis Wanda Muir, um, we have the legacy of John Muir in our time and we otherwise probably wouldn't. Uh, he's talked about Scottish workaholism. He says he probably would have just worked himself to death. So his legacy, well, here's his two daughters. Uh, he takes them out on camping trips and they become outspoken um, representatives for the preservation of wilderness. He is one of the co-founders of the Sierra Club. Uh, here is a whole group in which he's uh, giving a botanical lesson. And it's interesting, they're mostly, they're mostly women. <laughs> Here he is riding with Teddy Roosevelt through uh, Yosemite. Actually, there was a whole welcoming party. and Roosevelt ditched the party so that he could go camping with Muir uh, up in the um, Sierra there above uh, on Glacier Point. They awoke in the morning with snow on their blankets, and, and Roosevelt said, what a bully time. He loved it. Um, and so there are the two of them together. Muir often wore this kind of sprig on his lapel. Um, and because of Muir, uh, Roosevelt realized how important it was uh, to go into the wilderness. Actually, uh, Ro Teddy Roosevelt had some experiences earlier in life. Uh, the, the very same day, his wife and his mother died. And uh, grief-stricken, he went off to the North Dakota Badlands um, in order to recuperate. And he realized how important wilderness was. So therefore, we have a Theodore Roosevelt National Park in, uh, in North Dakota. So um, he was well familiar with, with uh, the wilderness. Um, it advanced here for some reason. So there they are. There's Roosevelt and there's Muir at the Sequoias. 
and um, Muir is trying to encourage Roosevelt to uh, preserve the sequoias. And he did, of course, in Sequoia National Monument, which is Sequoia National Park today. And uh, here's Teddy Roosevelt's legacy, uh, 150 national forests, 51 federal bird reserves, four national game preserves, 18 national monuments, five national parks, including Grand Canyon, Olympic, Crater Lake, Wind Cave, and Mesa Verde. And much of this is because of the influence of John Muir on him. This is the great, great grandson of John Muir, and he is carrying on uh, the work. His name is Robert Hanna. I have him as a friend on Facebook. Uh, and he is constantly campaigning for greater wilderness preservation. And a couple of years ago, the great, great grandson of John Muir, that's Robert Hanna, and the great, great grandson of Teddy Roosevelt, that's Kermit Roosevelt III, wrote this article in, uh, in a uh, journal um, in, in Washington. They were actually talking about what was happening with Bears Ears National Monument and how it needed to be preserved. So the legacy goes on. Okay, so uh, let's get to this, this whole aspect of Muir morphing American Christianity into a new wilderness mysticism. What I see among a lot of my students is nature really is a big part of their spirituality. Nature is a big way that they have of connecting to the divine and experiencing oneness with the divine. Of course, that's what mysticism is, that oneness with the divine. But it's through nature. Um, more and more, there are more and more people who consider themselves nuns, that is N-O-N-E-S. They don't have any one tradition that they identify with, but many of them discover nature as a big part of that. And interestingly, in the Christian tradition, we see that this whole wilderness preservation movement um, morphed itself into this kind of nature mysticism. So when Muir came to California, he had this kind of what he called a born-again conversion. Uh, he was in a valley that was surrounded completely, he said it was like a meadow, of golden wildflowers, hundreds of miles long and 50, 50 miles wide. And he just became ecstatic when he came to California, and uh, especially when he came to the Sierras. So his born-again conversion is, he says, never before this had we discovered that our bodies contain such multitudes of palates, or that this mortal flesh so little valued by philosophers and teachers is possessed of so vast a capacity for happiness. Uh, we were new creatures. He was there with a companion. Born again, and truly not until this time were we fairly conscious that we were born at all. Never more shall I sentimentalize about getting free from the flesh, for it is steeped like a sponge in a mortal pleasure. How glorious a conversion! Nature like a fluid seems to drench and steep us throughout as the whole sky and the rocks and the flowers are drenched with spiritual life with God. This is really unusual for a man, and especially a man in the Victorian era, to have this level of body awareness and to realize that the body is actually an organ for spiritual awareness. He often said that he received more... Uh, pleasure through his feet than through his eyes in other words as he hiked so part of that's part of his conversion is this uh, this whole sense that he can feel the landscape in his body and i got up one day at sunrise <coughs> when we were camped at yosemite um to take some photos and there is half dome and some spirea flowers in the foreground it's also the photo that's on the cover of one of my books so the body steeped in a mortal pleasure. So interestingly, Muir campaigned to show how the wild places are outdoor temples. Um, Europe had cathedrals, and at the time, late 19th century, Americans sort of had an inferiority complex because we didn't have the same kind of cathedrals. But we began to realize that our natural areas are our outdoor cathedrals and our outdoor temples. 
that is West Temple at Zion National Park. If you've ever been to Zion, it's just absolutely magnificent there in southwestern Utah. And of course, many of the features here named by Mormons actually are named, uh, there's Temple of Sinawava, West Temple, um, and there's, there's many different uh, areas that are seen to, to, uh, to have a temple quality. So some people want to argue that, that preserving temples of nature um, is, is, is a kind of a modern idea and that really wilderness always has people in it. But I went to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science once and saw this exhibit where they compressed all of life into one year, all of Earth's history into one year. And if you were to do that, this is what you would find. On January 1st, the Earth forms. On March 20th, life begins in the oceans. Now look at this. Not till November 29th does life move onto the land. On December 10th, the dinosaurs appear, and on December 31st, humanity makes its entrance. So what are we preserving in the wilderness and national parks? We are preserving what most of Earth history was until December 31st, if you want to look at it in times of the uh, year, year span. We aren't just making some sort of artificial uh, contraption. We are preserving that silence and that sense of the grandeur of life before humans were here. And we desperately need that to get some perspective on our own lives. There I am in my backpacker's tent, that's up in the Flat Tops Wilderness um, in, the, in the mountains near Steamboat. Um, to get away and find that primordial sense of landscape, that primordial sense of the spirit um, that's been around for uh, billions of years. Uh, this I was taking up at Cirque of the Towers um, in the Wind River Range. I was expecting a pink glow on the peaks, and instead I got this kind of fire, and I was quite amazed. Um, this is another uh, temple rock. Uh, this here is in the Eastern Sierra. Those are paintbrush blossoms um, in the foreground, and here is another kind of temple. So John Muir says, wild parks are places of recreation, nature's cathedrals. Remember, that's why Congress uh, was preserving these. They were these cathedrals, which we could contact the divine, where all may gain inspiration and strength and get nearer to God. There's Temple Crag again in the Eastern Sierra. And that's Cathedral Peak. He says in his journal, this, I may say, is the first time I have been at church in California. Led here at last, every door opened for the worshiper. In our best times, everything turns into religion. All the world seems a church and the mountains altars. And that's the, uh, the quote there on the trail uh, at the beginning uh, of the, the trailhead there in Yosemite National Park. And there is some lupin with Cathedral Peak. So a prime experience of the divine for John Muir is that of beauty, divine beauty. If you think of it, beauty is something that lures us and woos us. You think of a sunset or you think of, um, of a deer running. It, it lures us. There isn't any, any shoulds about it, right? There's a luring quality about it. And that's what Muir discovered in the natural world. In the Psalms, the psalmist says, One thing I have asked of the Lord, that do I seek, that I may gaze on the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. And so John Muir says, No synonym for God is so perfect as beauty, whether seen carving the lines of the mountains and glaciers, or gathering matter into stars, planning the movements of water or gardening, still all is beauty and all beauties melt into one first God beauty. And then he says in a fragment on a slip of paper, heaven knows that John the Baptist was not more eager to get all his fellow sinners into the Jordan than I to baptize all mine in the beauty of God's mountains. Remember, stressful lifestyle is the prime way in which Muir sees um, our, what we call sin here, that is dis-ease. He says, when a human being is exposed to the beams of beauty which radiate from a mountain, he is tinged with pleasure 
and requires no training to enjoy a beauty that's also in himself. There's the transcendentalism, right? You see the beauty in the, the mountain, and then you're able to find the beauty in, within yourself. There's that kind of mirroring going on. This was amazing. Uh, so this is uh, Devil's Tower or Bear Lodge. I went up there at sunset and it was cloudy. And as so often happens, right at sunset, there's a little sliver of, of clear sky right on the horizon. And just as the sun was setting, it put the alpenglow right on the tower and a double rainbow. Okay, so in the early church, there were two Bibles. There was the Bible, there was the two scriptures. There was the scripture of the Bible, and there was the scripture of the natural world. Same in the Celtic Christian tradition that would have been in Muir's ancestry. So he really wants us to learn to see nature as a Bible. In other words, it is a sacred scripture. Um, we shouldn't just have our heads buried in the words of the book. We need to have ourselves buried in the scripture of the natural world. So he says the notion seems to be all but universal, that we can know God only by tradition, as if the fountains of inspiration have gone dry, and he has not yet a single word more to say to us, not another story to tell. But God is yet writing passages we can understand that come within the range of our sympathies. Yosemite Fall is a Bible. That's 3,000 feet high, right? <clears throat> And miles and miles of tree scripture, they are a Bible that will one day be read. The beauty of its letters and sentences have burned me like fire through all these Sierra seasons. Whatever we can read in the world is contained in that sentence of boundless meaning, God is love. That is the substance and sum of all the sunshine utters and all that's spoken by the calms and storms of the mountains. So there's a line of tree scripture. Those are Aspens on Kebler, Kebler Pass in Colorado, one of my favorite places. The second largest Aspen Grove in the world is there. So he says, clouds of plant color, they are a revelation, a thus saith the Lord of color. There is a wild geranium leaf also on an Aspen in Kebler, uh, an Aspen Grove in Kebler Pass. I mounted this one, I've got it on canvas downstairs. So he even says that Jesus got his Sermon on the Mount from the Sierra. <laughs> he says, pines and waters and deep singing winds all sing of fountain love, just as Jesus Christ did, and all of pure God and manif manifest in whatever form. You say, he's talking to a friend of his here who's kind of a fundamentalist Christian. You say that good people are nearer to the heart of God than are woods and fields, rocks and waters? Such distinctions and measurements seem strange to me. Rocks and waters, etc., are words of God, and so are people. Jesus lived in Palestine, but his Sermon on the Mount shows that he knew all about the rocks and waters of our California Sierras and about the blessed angels that dwell in these. So he has this sense, this sense that blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the peacemakers, um, and so forth, um, are something that the natural world can teach us. There's a cone there in uh, pollen on the edge of the water here, and that's Mount Hoffman, Hoffman in the background in Yosemite National Park. So he develops a kind of Christian animism. Um, and it's interesting, his, his relationship to Native Americans, when he was in California, most of the tribes had been decimated by the time he got there. So he only saw sort of a, a, a person or two in the mountains. But when he went to Alaska, he saw whole tribes living in their original state. He also saw whole mountains that were full of bones where smallpox had devastated, smallpox brought by the Europeans, had devastated entire tribes. Um, so, um, but when he went to Alaska, he spent a lot of time with the natives and he started to realize more and more the spirit of, that is at the root of every creature. So he says, to the Indian mind, all nature is instinct with deity. A spirit is embodied in every mountain, stream, and waterfall. How significant does every atom of our world become amid the influence of these beings, unseen spiritual angelic mountaineers? I cannot refrain from speaking to this little bush at my side and to the spray drops that come to my paper 
and to the individual sands of the slopelet I am sitting upon. The spirits of these rocks and waters hail us after long waiting as their kinsmen and persuade us to closer communion. Many still small voices as well as the noon thunder are calling us to come higher, and so are the clouds of witnesses of insects and flowers which tell of nature's joy and love. So you see what he does here? He morphs these biblical themes into a natural context. So um, the, in the, the book of First Kings in the Hebrew Bible talks about Elijah, that a still small voice, that God is, is not in the, hurric- is not in the uh, whirlwind, um, is not in the windstorm, but is in the a still small voice. And so Muir is saying that these still small voices um, are calling to us constantly in the natural world. And also in the book of Hebrews, uh, the author talks about the cloud of witnesses, which is people of faith who have gone on before us, who are able to uh, help us out in our time of need. And Muir sees the cloud of witnesses in the insects and in the flowers. I took this picture on a backpacking trip in the Tetons, um, and I was amazed to see the face there. a kind of animism, the spirit in the landscape. Even rocks, he says, have a kind of life perhaps not so different from ours as we imagine. Anyhow, their material beauty is only a veil covering their spiritual beauty, a divine incarnation in stonation. He coined a term there. Uh, Oftentimes people talk of Jesus as an incarnation, God incarnate. Well, for Muir, uh, God in stonate is in stones. He says, I love to travel miles deep among the holy ghosts of glaciers. So he sees the spirit there in the glaciers. Even our memories of the wild saturate every fiber of the body and soul dwelling in us and with us like holy spirits through all our lives. So even memories, he connects to the Holy Spirit and as holy spirits. The whole wilderness seems to be alive and familiar, full of humanity. The very stones seem talkative, sympathetic, brotherly. No wonder when we consider that we all have the same father and mother. So you see how he's morphing these Christian themes into this kind of American wilderness context. And there he is communing with the rocks. This is a petrified forest um, national park. And that's Arthur's Rock just west of me. Uh, you can see the face there. Uh, it faces the western sky. Indeed, an instonation. Um, he talks about being a John the Baptist taking Sequoia Eucharist to his friend Gene Carr. He writes, do behold the king in his glory, King Sequoia. Behold, behold, seems all I can say. Some time ago, I left all for Sequoia and have been and am at his feet, fasting and praying for light. I've taken the sacrament with Douglas Squirrel, drunk Sequoia wine, Sequoia blood, And with its rosy purple drops, I am writing this woody gospel letter. I wish I were so sequoiacal that I could preach the green brown woods to all the juiceless world, descending from this divine wilderness like a John the Baptist crying, repent for the kingdom of sequoia is at hand. Sick or successful, come suck sequoia and be saved. You say, when are you coming down to town? Ask the Lord, Lord sequoia. There's a Sequoia's cousin, a redwood. Uh, I took this picture in the Ladybird Johnson Grove, um, and there's a fern with the spider webs on it. Magnificent trees. You see why Muir got so excited about them. And he even talks about the Sequoia being a, like a Christ tree. Uh, he talked about a tree where they uh, skinned the bark off of it and then took it to Europe uh, to serve as a dance floor to show how big the tree was. And then when he visits the tree, he says, this grand sequoia tree is, of course, dead, a ghastly disfigured ruin, but it still stands as if alive and saying, forgive them, they know not what they do. Those, of course, are the words of Jesus on the cross. So he's seeing this, this presence in the sequoias. And that, of course, is what they used to do. They'd cut down a tree and then they'd drive a car up on top. Uh, so he started to campaign with Teddy Roosevelt and others that they needed to, they needed to start preserving uh, these. Oh, what happened here? There we go. 
Uh, there he is by a sugar pine, one of his favorite uh, trees. He also talks about baptism frequently. He talks about being completely immersed. He says, I was, of course, in the Christian tradition, baptism is a symbolic of the old self washing away and the new self uh, being born as you come up out of the water. He says, I was baptized three times this morning, first in the balmy sunshine that penetrated to my soul, warming all the faculties of spirit, as well as the joints and marrow of the body. Second, in the mysterious rays of beauty that emanate from plant corollas. And third, in the spray of the lower Yosemite Falls. There in the falls, some of the earthiness washed out of me and Yosemite virtue washed in. Now I shall have another baptism. I'll bathe in the high sky among cool wind waves from the snow. Heaven knows that John the Baptist was not more eager to get all his fellow sinners into the Jordan than I to baptize all mine in the beauty of God's mountains. There was a time when Muir went out, he wanted to um, experience what he called a moonbow, that is a rainbow that occurs from the spray uh, in conjunction with the moonlight. And so he basically went to the edge of a cliff, shimmied out on a three inch ledge until he got directly behind Yosemite Falls, which plunges 3000 feet into the valley. And as the wind pushed the falls briefly away, he shimmied behind and clung onto a rock. And um, then, <laughs> then when the water came back, it was pummeling him. Uh, but he called it his, uh, his baptism. He liked to do crazy things like that all the time, which is one of the reasons I love him so much. There's Yosemite Falls. So he would have been up toward the top there on a three-inch ledge behind those falls. There he is. That would be, uh, he's above Nevada Falls there in the park. And uh, I took this picture at Vernal Falls. Very difficult to get. It's on the John Muir, the Mist Trail. Uh, I probably had to clean my lens off because of the spray from the water uh, probably 20 times before I got something uh, where uh, I could uh, not have water droplets all over the, the entire picture. Beautiful place. Um, okay, so any questions or thoughts uh, before we move on? I'm glad you had Vernal Falls there. That's my favorite waterfall, I think. I love oh. that, the Mist Trail. Yeah, yeah, isn't it amazing? <clears throat> it's like a pilgrimage, all the people going up and down those stone steps. Huh? Uh. Any others of you? I'm just loving all of this because for me, nature is my very best friend. <laughs> and when I can go to the water and even just, and I live in, the, in Loveland, oh. and there's a place up the Big Thompson River that they closed for winter and it's usually opened up before now and they just opened it up last week sometime. And I went back yesterday or day before yesterday and it was open. And I just so resonate with what he says about nature because when I drove into that place and could actually get in, I just sat there and cried yeah. because of how it is. And I actually found myself just going to a place, sitting down, listening to the river, and I was there for four hours. Wow. And uh, so thank you for sharing this because... Yeah, you're welcome. It is, it is, and to me, for me, this is how I'm going to get through these times that we're in. Mm -hmm. Because this is where I can go and there's no problems. <laughs> so, I agree. Yeah. just thank you because there's so much of this. It's just like, yes, yes, yes. You know, people ask me, well, what church do you go to? And I said, oh, I have my own sanctuary and it's up the canyon. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Well, you so, understand completely. Right. <laughs> so, thank you again. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're welcome. 
And thank goodness for John Muir and his influence on Teddy Roosevelt and his influence, you know, with the park system. Oh my gosh, where would we be if we didn't have that set aside? Yeah, yeah, where would we be? Yeah, so his his spirituality led directly to his activism. The two were, the two went hand in hand. Um, okay, well, I'll go on and, and share a few more things here. Uh, feel free to interrupt at any point. Um, so the Christian mystical teaching on divinization, in other words, that all of us uh, are divinized, that the divinity shines through us. Uh, he saw sunlight and flowing water as mediators of this kind of divinity. In other words, we experience our divine nature in the process of being in uh, sunlight or in flowing water. Uh, so he says, so there's the verse in Second Peter for people that say that the idea that we're participating in the divine nature is something that's not Christian. There it is right there. He says, creation like sunlight is all one outpour emanation from God the Son. All physical phenomena, when followed up, are found rooted and growing in God. He says, the warm, looking at uh, streams, he says, the warm blood of God flows through all things, which are like blood globules pulsing in the heart of God. So each of us is like a, like a red cell or a blood globule in the stream of God. He says, all things are divinized in morning light. God's holy light makes all divine. And then, so there's the sunlight image and then the stream image. Nature like a fluid seems to drench and steep us throughout as the whole sky and the rocks and the waters are drenched with spiritual life with God. So I think all of us realize when we spend a lot of time in sunlight, um, there's a sense that we open up, we become more spacious, and we go beyond um, the constrictions of our um, psychological self. And when we're with the streams, we're able to flow more easily. We're able to allow uh, things to wash away. So that's the silver apron. That is between Nevada Falls and Vernal Falls. And that's uh, my wife and her sister there uh, watching it. You can shimmy right up just about to that point um, on that sandstone rock. And it's very powerful. So he viewed Alpenglow as a prime mediator of divinization, revealing uh, through transfiguration the inner sacredness that's already present in all things. Alpenglow, so, is the, you know, um, for those of you who, who live east of mountains, um, in the early morning when the sun first rises, before it actually breaks the horizon, you see the mountains light up in a kind of pink or purple. Um, and similarly, if you live west of the mountains, you see that happen at night. Well, Muir saw Alpenglow as the most impressive of all the terrestrial manifestations of God. He said the Alpenglow is so holy, spiritual, even the inspired atmosphere of the New Jerusalem is inadequate. In this light of light, rocks and seas and everything is not only illumined, but transfigured and fused and changed into religion. And the transfiguration, you know, Jesus goes up on a mountain and, and the light from within his divine self appears outwardly um, on his face and in his clothes. And that's what Muir is saying is happening in uh, the natural world. He says, in the purple light of morning and evening, things become still more impressively steeped in the divine light of the Alpen glow. All their earthiness disappears into spiritual beauty. They seem neither high nor low but they melt into the universal beauty as part of their maker. So there's oneness there. Everything seems translucent as if lighted from within by its own internal light. So there's Alpenglow on Half Dome. <clears throat> there's Alpenglow on Mount Hoffman, also in Yosemite. That is from Lower Cathedral Lake. In mysticism, there is always a sense of self-loss, right? In order to become something bigger than what you are. So in uh, the Christian tradition, that's called kenosis, which is the Greek word for self-emptying. So there is this paradoxical kind of experience where when we lose ourselves into the divine, then something new is born. 
Well, Muir experienced this in the natural world. He would lose himself in union, what he called nature, God. So once at a vast golden meadow in a place called Twenty Hill Hollow in the Eastern Sierra, he wrote this, hide in the hills of Twenty Hill Hollow, lave in its waters, tan in its golds, bask in its flower shine, and your baptisms will make you a new creature indeed. Here your soul will breathe deep and free in God's shoreless atmosphere of beauty and love. You cannot feel yourself out of doors, plain sky and mountains ray beauty which you feel. You bathe in these spirit beams turning round and round as if warming at a campfire. Presently you lose consciousness of your own separate existence. You blend with the landscape and become part and parcel of nature. So there's the self-loss, right? The, the melting and blending into something bigger. Um, there's a meadow full of golden flowers. This one happens to be in the snowy range in Wyoming, um, and those are uh, globe flowers. So Muir had an experience like this where he's surrounded by acres of these flowers, and the beauty uh, is just all around him and in him. But when we lose ourselves, and this is the characteristic of Christian mysticism, when we lose ourselves into the divine, in this case, into the vastness of nature, then we reappear as um, our true self. So Muir says, as we study and mingle with nature more, the pain caused by the melting of all beauties into one first God beauty disappears, because after their first baptismal submergence in fountain God, they go again washed and clean into their individualisms, more clearly defined than ever, unified yet separate. So a lot of people fear mysticism because they think that if they let go of themselves and emerge into something bigger, they're just going to disappear. And that's a fearful thing, right? If you're used to hanging on to your um, usual sense of self. But the thing is, um, as I often tell my students, there isn't a need to fear because the moment that we empty ourselves into the divine, the divine empties back into us. So there's some pasque flowers coming up through the, uh, through the snow. That's horsetooth rock uh, just west of here. Symbolic of us coming at, back out uh, after losing ourselves. Interestingly, when we lose ourselves, we simultaneously experience love. It's, we all go around trying to get love for the self, right? But he said if we release the self, then suddenly everything loves us. With inexpressible delight, you wade out into the landscape. He was in a meadow, feeling yourself contained in one of nature's most sacred chambers, secure from yourself, and your hard, restricting shell of individuality is at once dissolved. Right? There's the self-loss. Free in the universal beauty as when you gaze into the vistas of a sunrise or sunset. And you seem dissolved in it, yet, Everything about you is beating with warm terrestrial human love and life delightfully substantial and familiar. So there is the, the love that appears when you let go of the, of the need to cling on to love. In so wild and beautiful a region was spent my day, every sight and sound inspiring, leading one far out of oneself, yet feeding and building up his individuality. So when we let go of the need to have to grasp onto expressions of love or this self that we cling on to, lo and behold, we're given it back in a whole new way. So here's the solitary hiker at Yellowstone Lake, uh, which is, um, you get the sense that he's dissolving there into the beauty of that scene. So in this union with God through nature, there's a two-way exchange. On the one hand, we take on nature's non-personal ego transcending qualities. So you think of it in terms of, um, we take on billions of years of rock, earth history, right? We're able to let go of our little concerns uh, because we're by that river or we're in the mountains or we're in the Grand Canyon and suddenly we, we feel small in a good sense and we realize we're able to take on billions of years of earth history and identify with that instead of our own little ego self. But on the flip side, as always happens in mystical union, nature takes on our personality. 
So we become more transpersonal and nature becomes more personal. So we take on um, the transpersonal aspects of nature and nature takes on our personality. So as an example of the first aspect there, Muir says, I think that one of the properties of that compound which we call man is that when exposed to the rays of mountain beauty, it glows with joy. He's using the language of chemistry there, right? So there's this sort of this chemistry that happens. He says, nature offers fresh views into oneself and into human nature, for the wilderness is a shrewd touchstone, an analytical chemist of character, bringing the curious compounds of humanity to light. So he's starting to see himself in terms of the landscape. On the other hand, he sees the landscape become personal. He says, the whole landscape glows like a human face in the glory of enthusiasm. The landscape is beaming with consciousness like the face of a god. Nature becomes more personal. We become more transpersonal. That's the way mystical union is. It's an, always an exchange of qualities. And there I am um, exulting in the aspens of the, the Rewa Range, west of here. Union with nature for Muir is a participation in a divine joy. He says the work of creation is still going on. God is doing his best in it, working like a person in a glow of enthusiasm and making everything sing the first song of creation to shake up and surprise and frighten even the dullest, least sensitive observer in a newness of life out of soul-wasting apathy and to make us live again. He's talking about his experience at Yellowstone here with the hot springs and geysers. I shall hope to see you with the sparkle and exhilaration of the mountains still in your eyes. So there's a sense of joy. And if there's one thing you get from Muir's writings, it's this kind of joy. And how could you not have joy in a place like this? Um, this is Grand Prismatic Spring in Yellowstone National Park. Everybody's, you know, they stay down on the boardwalks to see it, but to get a, really a view of it, you have to go up above. And actually, each of those colors that you see there, that's actually a different um, uh, species of, of uh, algae, uh, thermophiles, they're called. They're a microorganism, actually, and they grow at certain temperatures. So it's hottest in the middle. There's nothing growing there where it's blue. Uh, but then as you get into the green and the yellow and the orange, each of those is represented by a different um, thermophile or organism that grows just at that temperature as the water cools off as it go moves from the center. It's an absolutely amazing place. Actually, they studied some of those thermophiles for um, uh, medicinal uses in the pharmaceutical industry. Okay, for Muir, Joy is not a mere feeling that we happen to have. It actually has epistemological value. In other words, joy is a faculty that gives us knowledge we otherwise would not have. So, in fact, joy is a faculty that affects our union with nature. So, he says, we are now fairly into the mountains and they are into us. What bright, seething, white fire enthusiasm, there's the joy, is bred in us without our help or knowledge, a perfect influx into every pore and cell of us, fusing, vaporizing by its heat until the boundary walls of our heavy flesh tabernacle seem taken down and we flow out and diffuse into the air. Now I am no longer a mere shepherd, this was his first summer in the Sierra, but a free bit of everything. So you see there the joy, the enthusiasm is a kind of heat that melts us into union with the divine in nature. It's not just an, a subjective emotion. It's not just something we happen to have um, and enjoy. It actually is a faculty of knowledge. And for Muir, this joy is what gives him this awareness of this, this union that he feels. Uh, and I love this, this photo. I took this uh, afterwards. See, this, those people are standing on a boardwalk okay, right at the Grand Prismatic Spring. And, and as I watched, it was like they were appearing and disappearing in the mist, right? They were fusing into the landscape and then reappearing again. It was kind of, it was kind of fun. Okay, he talks about a wilderness self that is interrelated to everything that is. It's not just a billiard ball. 
So he says most people are on the world, not in it. They have no conscious sympathy or relationship to anything about them. Undiffused, separate, and rigidly alone like marbles of polished stone, touching but separate. That's kind of what we're tempted to, to feel um, in the, the modern era, this sort of individualism, um, or where every nation just goes at it alone. Uh, this, 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 these polished marbles, and that's all they are, they only relate to each other extrinsically. But Muir realized that there's an actual internal connectedness between the natural world and us. How complete is the absorption of one's life into the spirit of mountain woods? Humanity is so related to all of nature that it is built of small worlds. And then he meditates on the verse that says that God made humanity of the dust of the earth. He said, well, what was in that dust? He says, it contained fields and forests, complete all the mountain ranges of the world, suns and moons and animals and plants and minerals. Um, Muir was very interesting. He embraced the theory of Darwin's theory of evolution, which had come along in the 1850s. Um, but he didn't think it was natural selection and nature red and tooth and claw that was the mechanism of evolution. He thought it was actually love, that uh, everything's striving um, to become who it is uh, through love. So there is this kind of interrelated wilderness self that we are a part of everything. I took this picture west of here in Laurie State Park, and I've always been amazed when I see this blanket flower or gallardia. There's a moth that lives on it, and every time I've seen it, the moth orients itself so that the red wings go with the red part of the flower, and then the yellow head goes on the yellow uh, ray flowers. Symbolic of us being a part of nature. I don't know the name of the moth, but it seems to be specific to this gallardia plant. So the true self, as he sees it, is transparent to beauty. <clears throat> he says, our flesh and bone tabernacle seems transparent as glass to the beauty about us. This is part of how we interweave with everything. There's a certain transparency to the self where we're able to take in qualities and um, be a, a window through to it. We are thrilling with the air and trees, streams and rocks and the waves of the sun, a part of all nature, neither old nor young, sick nor well, but immortal. So we're transparent. Uh, we're tr remember Emerson had talked about being a transparent eyeball that sees all things and allows them to pass through us. Muir says, I am like a flake of glass through which the light passes. I care only to entice people to look at nature's loveliness. My own special self is nothing. He, he didn't try to build himself up, but lost himself in the passion that he felt for the natural world. That's where he found himself, by losing himself and becoming like this flake of glass. I took this picture up at Lake Hayaha in Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, it's the only mountain on the east side in the park there that's got the blue ice. Kind of hard to get to. Sometimes it's kind of an avalanche slope and I lucked out this time and got up there okay. Uh, symbolic of the fact that we're like this, this blue glass uh, through which the creation can be seen. I took this picture up on Dream Lake. I'm kind of crazy. I like to go up there on really windy days. I've gotten a fair bit of frostbite uh, from it, uh, but I'm lying on my stomach here with my camera down in a trough in the ice next to this rock out in the middle of the lake and shooting up through that ice to Hallett Peak beyond. Uh, but it's symbolic of that being like the glass through which um, the world can be seen. And these are icicles uh, on a lake near here, Watson Lake, symbolic again of us being a transparent window through which nature can be seen. We are also called to embody and give voice to the divine in nature. He says, landscapes in some measure, no doubt, enjoy us because we were made for them. We're like a stream that falls through the sky in rain or snow and flows down the mountains, giving voice to all the rock on which it goes. So we too are meant to give voice to the parts of nature that flow through us and to the parts of nature that we enjoy. We do this through our poetry, our music, our philosophy, our spiritual practices, and there is a stream here in the Comanche Peak Wilderness with Perry Primrose uh, growing right beside it. 
he talks about this kind of mutual song. Remember, mysticism is sort of this two-way union and communion. In this case, where nature becomes more personal and we become more transpersonal. So he says, every bird song, wind song, storm song, and tremendous song of the rocks and the heart of the mountains is our song and sings our love. So it's like we're seeing our own song out in the mountains, and it has a personality of its own that sings about our love. Even the rocks seem to be shouting, awake, awake, rejoice, rejoice, come love us and join in our song. So it's a kind of mutual song. Well, Mueller talked about a storm song, and that's what I had this one day here up by Mills Lake in Rocky Mountain National Park. I was up there to see the Alpenglow, and I got a little bit more than I bargained for. Uh, the wind came up. I actually got some frostbite on my nose uh, here. It was so incredibly cold, but it was worth it because I got to experience this song of the wind and the beauty of the Alpenglow in the setting. Muir had a love affair with nature. It wasn't just that he embodied nature. It wasn't just that uh, he had a communion with nature that was part him and he part it. He actually had a full-blown love affair with nature. Um, Terry Tempest Williams, a modern nature writer, talks about an erotics of place. She talks about this close relationship with nature that is similar to what we feel with a human lover. So Muir could say, into these mountain mansions, nature has taken pains to gather her choicest treasures to draw her lovers into close and confiding communion with her. The Sierra, its marvelous beauty, displayed in striking and alluring forms, woos the admiring wanderer on and on, higher and higher, charmed and enchanted. I seem to be more than married to icy Mount Shasta. That's in California. And one of Muir's friends says, never have I met another man of such singleness of mind and his devotion to nature as Muir. He lived and moved and had his being as a devotee. He would talk by the hour of his beloved mistress. It was the passion of his life. And remember, it was Muir's wife that pushed him back out into the mountains because she couldn't stand living with this guy that wasn't passionate, um, just uh, tired, uh, just... Uh, working in the orchards. So there he is in his beloved temple. There he is later in life, very happy to be with his beloved landscape. And there is uh, a beautiful place on Lower Cathedral Lake. That's a kind of a glacier polish on there. The rocks came and, and polished it. And those are red feldspar crystals. There are often times when the forms of nature um, remind us of our passion, and the color red is certainly that. And so we fall in love with the beauty of the landscape. And this is a uh, penstemon, mountain pride penstemon, it's called, and that's in Yosemite National Park. Uh, reminds us of that beautiful love affair that we have. Sometimes mountains and, for, and various landscapes remind us of human forms, which remind us of the passion that we have in the landscape. And how did that get there? Uh, I took that on my descent from um, Lower Cathedral Lake, and there it was, right in this pine. Um, so we're meant to have a love affair with something larger than just people. Uh, people are wonderful, but unless we fall in love with the world, we're never going to take care of it. We can say all we want that we should and what will happen to us if we don't, but it's a kind of love affair, just as when we love a person, we want their best, and we, we want them to burgeon and grow, and we, we, want, we want to do everything we can to make them happy. So it is, we need this kind of love affair with the landscape. This is on the John Muir Trail. That's my wife on the left, and that's um, her sister on the right. Uh, this this full-blown love affair with the landscape is what enables us to uh, have an extra layer of motivation to care for it. Um, any questions to this point? We'll be uh, through soon. 
did he ever go back to his wife or, or did she join him a lot? I mean, you showed his daughters being conservationists and all, but how, how did his personal life, you know, family life meld into his later years? Uh, he did, he did a lot of writing um, in the den, in the house. So he would go off on these explorations, but then he would come home. Ah. Uh. Yeah. But it's just she pushed him uh, off um, onto his adventures, but then he would come home. Then he'd go out on another adventure, and then he would come home. Um, so it was kind of this interplay that he had uh, be between the two uh, aspects of his life. Then later on, um, his wife died, and um, then he moved. His youngest daughter uh, had... Uh, uh, pneumonia a lot so they moved to Arizona in the petrified forest area where um, she could recuperate um, and then it was then that that uh, his two daughters got very involved in his conservation work mm. Stephen I was wondering you mentioned Celtic Christianity yes and how does that you know what what differentiates Celtic Christianity from traditional Christianity? Uh, Celtic Christianity has a deeper connection to nature. Mm. Uh, so it really uh, preserves that sense that um, nature is a second scripture. John Philip Newell talks about this a lot, and of course, John O'Donohue. Uh, if you've seen the book Anam Kara. Yes, uh, I love yeah. that book. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it, it retains the connection to nature. Mm -hmm. Celtic Christianity also retains the sense that there is a goodness at the heart of all things. Mm -hmm. um, and Celtic Christianity tended to have a more egalitarian view uh, of men and women and of all people, um, that they're uh, all on equal footing and equally made in the image and likeness of God. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, in, it uh, emphasizes finding God in nature? Definitely. And it emphasizes the um, finding the, the scripture of nature, finding that, that second Bible, and of reading it. And uh -huh. so that means going out and saying, you know, what, what is the divine speaking to me in all of these um, various things that I'm attracted to in the natural world. The, the fact that we're attracted to certain aspects of the landscape um, occurs because um, they are, they are attracting us. They want to speak to us. And so, yes, this was a big part of Celtic Christianity, and this was a big part of John Muir's um, spirituality as well. Okay. And was he raised, he wasn't raised in Celtic Christianity, though, was he? You know, um, I think the interesting thing is that things go with us, even if they're not conscious. Mm -hmm. And so it's in his background. And um, so even though his father would have rejected a lot of that, mm -hmm. it was in his genes. And this is a lot of what's a lot, a lot of the work is now, you know, people feel like they can sort of reject a certain religion, uh, but it's always with them. And similarly, our ancestors, I often tell people, you know, sometimes people are born into a family and they feel like very little connection. So mm -hmm. I think that it's important to go back and look at one's ancestors and realize there's a precedent for where we are uh, that, that who we are has come from something in our past relatives in our past who uh, who embody those aspects of who we are right i just want to say i appreciate you risking your health for those um gorgeous <laughs> photos that you <laughs> those are tremendous oh i'm glad you enjoyed them yeah uh it's funny because I go up on those lakes, you know, and I'm lying down and people think this, that I'm hurt. <laughs> you have to lie down in your stomach to put the camera down in the trough there. Uh, it, it's a trough of ice that forms between the boulder and the rest of the lake surface. Um, I also do a lot of um, 
of lying down in ash. I love to go up after forest fires and lie down in the ash, especially the next spring, um, and shoot pictures of the flowers that come up in abundance um, through that ash um, with all of the blackened trees. Hmm. And people look at me like I'm crazy, which I probably am. <laughs> but uh, I at least feel like I have John Muir uh, as an elder in that, that he would understand uh, what I'm about. What, where does the ash come from? Uh, from the, all of the uh, pine needles and logs on the ground and uh, the, all the plant matter that's burned up. Oh, I see. And then what happens is that converts all the nutrients that were tied up in, say, the pine needles and twigs. It converts it to fertilizer. And then when the rains come, if the fire hasn't been too hard, you know, if the fire is too hot, it bakes the surface of the soil and the nutrients can't get through. Uh, however, um, if it's not too hot of a fire, all it's like a shot of fertilizer that mm -hmm. happens. Um, and the next spring, the wildflowers are just absolutely amazing. Wow. So, yeah. Burns, burns are on my longer version of this presentation. I have, uh, I have some um, photos from the burns, but um, I didn't put them in this one. Any other thoughts or questions about all of this? <laughs> He is amazing, but thank you so much for educating me. I knew I, I've known of John Muir my whole life, but not to this, not yeah. his whole life, you know, to this yeah. step, this beautiful. Oh, and I think he's very much a person for our time. Um, he's a person who found his spirituality in the natural world. And so many young people, that's how they feel. They find their connection to spirit. They find their union with the divine in the natural world. And so he's a person that speaks to that. I think of him as a Renaissance man in that he's passionately alive and joyful. Even though he experienced child abuse from his dad, he loved children later. It's not, you know, some people, they perpetuate the pattern, right? But um, so he had two daughters and he just, he was the best father. And um, he always had kids climbing all around him. You know, he'd give them stuff, uh, pieces of plants and flowers and things. And so he, he, he's a fascinating guy. He's a mystic, he's a scientist, and yet he can go, so he can, he can study objectively you know, what form a certain mountain or whatever. And yet um, he'll go to an overlook and just start crying because mm -hmm. he finds it so beautiful. And some friends would, you know, they'd say, well, how come you're crying? Should you always wear your heart on your sleeve? And he said, well, what, what kind of time is this to be thinking of where my heart is? <laughs> on my, you know, just, I'm just so overwhelmed by the beauty of this landscape. So, yeah, he really, uh, I think... It, I think that's why he inspires so many people now. I mean, you've seen there's T-shirts, there's coffee mugs, there's bumper stickers. The mountains are calling and I must go, right? It's all over everything. And I think it's his, his buoyancy, his joy, and yet his, his joy leads to social action. Um, he has a mystical approach to knowledge, to, to nature. He feels one. He believes in science. Uh, he could do 30 mile hikes. One of the things he says that, you know, the beatings he received as a kid sort of, he internalized as a kind of self-discipline. He could, he went on these mountain climbs alone and nobody now can figure out how he did them. On the other hand, he had this tender heart. Um, he constantly felt this receptivity to the beauty of the natural world. Uh, so he combined all of these various qualities, you know, into one person. And uh, it's, for that reason, he's really inspiring. I think he's a true Renaissance man. And we desperately need that. I mean, we need people, men and women of that sort. But I think we especially need men 
we need young men to see that there's a different way to be a man than what's been shown them, you know. And I think John Muir is a good example of that. He's tough, and yet he has a tender heart. Yeah, and, and it sounded like um, the most powerful influences on his thinking and on his love of nature were all women. Yeah, that is a very interesting thing. In fact, oftentimes, I think um, he felt that he could relate to women better because he was a person of the heart, even though he's this scientist, he was a person of the heart and he felt that they could understand the passion that he felt. And he wasn't afraid to show his emotions. So yeah, it, it really is interesting that he had such close relationships to women throughout his whole life. And then it's very interesting to think that he had two daughters who yeah. then carried on his legacy. I, I, have, I have his daughter's families on Facebook, uh, you know, and I'll put pictures up and they'll like them and such. Um, some, some of you might also be interested. I think it's on Vimeo. Uh, I don't think it's on Amazon Prime yet. Um, so there was a movie that a Boulder filmmaker made um, a couple years ago. It's called The Unruly Mystic John Muir. And um, I'm interviewed in that movie. Shelton Johnson, who I referred to earlier, uh, the park naturalist, is interviewed in that movie. Um, Matthew Fox, uh, Celtic Christian, John Philip Newell, um, and um, some others. But that's a good place to see other people whose influence has, has been on John Muir. Mm -hmm. uh, he's kind of a star in the moment, and I think part of that's because of the the desperateness of our times and the depression and and the, the feeling locked in of, of to a human-made world. And here's this person just overflowing with joy. He'd come dancing down the mountains back into town, you know, and he'd have his face smeared with uh, ash to, as a protection against the sun. People say he was like a John the Baptist or Elijah coming down from the mountains with this scraggly beard. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah. That was a nice section on your um, uh, Emerson and John Muir. You know, their differences and yeah. perspective and yeah. just looking at the same thing from different, very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's really interesting. And some of those differences, too, you only pick up when you've read Emerson and Thoreau, and then you read it, Muir's writings, and you realize, oh, he's, he's taking off on some such thing that, that Thoreau said or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting. I loved his, um, his, his description of Emerson. Yeah, as a <laughs> sequoia-like soul. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he was a transcendentalist also, maybe. He was. He was a transcendentalist, but he emphasized, you know, the other, the flip side of, of compared to what Emerson and Thoreau emphasized. Um, but yes, he was. So there's, there's that two-way mirroring, that mm -hmm. sense of oneness with nature, that sense of finding the divine presence in the natural world, and that sense of individuality, you know, uh, remember the... Uh, Emerson's famous essay, Self-Reliance, right, where he talks about um, being true to the calling of who you are. I mean, it, it's interesting that that's such a basis of our American uh, way. I mean, we think of the shadow side of that as, well, I'm just a lonesome person doing whatever I want. That's sort of that um, selfish individualism. But uh, from a spiritual perspective, you really see that in Emerson that don't follow what someone else has done, follow what your calling is. Mm. And, and, and don't try to, don't be in the herd mentality, but really find out who you are, because only you can be what you were created to be. So Muir was definitely in that mold. He, he felt that when people congregate, he says cities, it doesn't have to be just cities, it could be suburbs, or kind of what we're going through now, where we're all sort of glued to the news and what's next. 
you know, we just become these automatons trying to see what the next news item is sometimes. Um, whereas in the wilds, we're more free to become who we really are. Uh, we get in touch with the deeper levels of our uh, being. We get in touch with the true self. And so that's where Muir talked about in society, we often feel like we're, we're beaten into a paste, you know, and just constantly stirred and nothing can crystallize then because crystallization requires a certain amount of stillness. Whereas in nature, we really come to see who, who we are. Um, and, and so that's, you know. The challenge is to express it in society, not to leave it on the mountain. Right. That's right, yes. And of course, that's, that's what Muir did, is he, he ended up right back in society campaigning to preserve the wilderness. Um, but I think for all of us, Sigurd Olson talks about that. He says, when we go into the wilderness, um, it's to come back with gifts to bring for others. Um, and, and I find that for myself when I go away into the natural world. Uh, this, this past weekend, so I was at the Badlands and then I was in the Black Hills. And I like to read some of the Lakota, um, you know, uh, teachers and elders. And, and I, I find myself nourished. I find that I'm able to come back with a new perspective to bring to this crazy society that we all find ourselves in, especially now, none of us knows exactly what's going to happen. Um, and it's different than anything we've ever known. It's good to be able to go to a place where we, we can retain our center, get back in touch with who we, we are. And of course, that's what transcendentalism recommended. Go into nature to find out who you really are, um, to find out um, what you alone have been given by the creator. And the idea, of course, was that, that nature was relatively unfallen compared to humans. We have so many layers of complexity and, and that the natural world uh, has, a, has a certain closeness to the creator and that helps us, it mirrors us and then helps us to get in, in touch with that same uh, self within us. Yeah, and it can be done in a room through meditation as well. It can. Yeah. I mean, I think nature is, it just brings that up naturally, you know. With meditation, you have to make it more of an effort to go inside, get quiet, and, but, but it's there. No matter where we are, it's there. That's true. But of course, nature is there too. Right. Whether it's an open space nearby or whether it's a park down the street. Mm -hmm. um, I've discovered an interesting thing with Naropa students. Um, so I teach, a, it's a Buddhist university in Boulder, uh, founded by a Tibetan Buddhist lama, so many of you know. Um, but there are more and more students, it seems like we have a kind of a cultural ADHD, the sort of hyperactivity, um, distractedness, we go from one thing to the other. And the, the younger and younger students I have, every year there's more of it. In fact, I have students that have difficulty turning in assignments because they, they have trouble following through. And there are many reasons for that. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I've discovered, and mind you, this is at a Buddhist university which teaches meditation. Mm -hmm. Many students get to where they really have trouble meditating indoors. So what I do is I take them out to a park in one of my classes, I'll take them out to a sort of secluded section of Chautauqua Park. And we sit there and I have students say, I have never been able to meditate like I am now. Uh, and, you know, and just the way, it, it, the way it's set up, I mean, the muffled sounds. So you can hear the muffled sounds of the city in the distance, mm -hmm. you know, a construction and cars and voices. It helps you view your own thoughts as muffled. And, and the wide spaciousness of the sky around you, you know, and I let them lie down in the grass and they'll stare yeah. up at the sky while they meditate. Yeah. Uh, you know, so that it's, it's easier to see your own thoughts as sort of having an echo like quality, not, not quite the most real thing, you know, as compared to the spaciousness, <coughs> which corresponds, you know, the spaciousness of the sky corresponding to this spaciousness of, um, of divine awareness within us. So I'm finding more and more students that are able to meditate out in nature where they're not able to meditate um, in a room. Yeah. I had one student that was so empathic, she couldn't meditate indoors because she felt people's energies constantly coming inside of her. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to get away from them. 
So she'd go to the corner of her room to try to, when she would meditate in her room. When we went outside, she was like, oh, those people's energies just dissipate out into the sky. And I feel like myself. I, I feel like, you know, I'm really myself. Um, so I found that a very interesting phenomenon, which I, I didn't at all expect. But um, it's something that seems to be happening. The younger the generations get, the more there seems to be that, that need for something natural. Uh, because the, the ADD and the ADHD in their culture are, are just um, debilitating to them. My daughter used to have a camp, um, a children's camp, summer camp in the Catskills. Oh. And she had, um, you know, a range of ages from like three to 14, 15, you know. And when they would start getting rowdy and you know, just a little bit hyper. Um, she would take them outside and they would go into the woods and she would tell them, now each of you go find your place. Just, just walk around a little bit. Don't go too far, but walk around a little bit until you find a place where you want to sit. Uh. And then you're just going to sit there for about 20 minutes and you're going to, and you're going to try to notice as much as you can just look around you and notice as much as you can everything that you see. And then we're going to come back and you're going to tell us about what you saw. And the kids would just get so calm and they would sit there and just look around and, you know, and they would, they would take in everything that they saw and then they would come together and they would report, but it, they would be so calm afterwards and they loved it. They used to ask to do it. That's beautiful. That's really yeah. beautiful. Yeah. I remember you telling me that exercise, or Kara told me, I think, of that exercise. And I did it with our foster kids when we had them, and they loved it. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And they talk about, well, I saw this bug, and it was climbing up this yeah. leaf. And, you know, I mean, they would just take it all in and then retain it, you know. I take the students out. You know, there's a game you play with kids with ponderosa pines that we have around here. You know, uh, you, you, you stick your nose in the bark and you say, does it smell like butterscotch or does it smell like vanilla? Uh, and I had one student say it smelled like caramel. Uh -huh. uh, but just that, that, yeah, there really is. I mean, if you think of it, we all have come from indigenous cultures. We all have come from indigenous cultures, no matter what our background, that had have that nourishment in nature so there's something about ourselves that um, needs nature because uh, that's where we come from oh, yeah. and, and that and that teaches us who we are and so i mean each you know indigenous traditions talk about a spirit guide or a spirit animal or a certain landscape for me there are often certain trees or, or plants uh but uh Sometimes people act as though nature is just like some people's hobby. Uh, but I think it's interesting that in most indigenous cultures, at least in North America, there was no word for nature. Mm -hmm. There's no word in their language for nature because it's mm -hmm. just their whole life, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so it really makes sense that we would find out more of who we are um, in the natural world. I think, you know, so in religious traditions, like in Christianity, the Christian mystic looks at, at Christ and sees that Christ is a kind of mirror in whom they, they see who they are. Similarly, in Buddhism, you know, you, <clears throat> you have the teacher or you have the Buddha, and um, they become a kind of a mirror in which you see who you are. Well, that's what happens in the natural world. It becomes a mirror in which we see who we really are. And especially the landscapes that we gravitate toward that, that attract us. We, we can be sure that when we gravitate to a certain landscape, that, that it is pulling us as well, that um, it is attracting us. It's two-way. And of course, that's the prime teaching of mysticism. It's always two-way. Uh, so if we feel a calling to go out to that particular place in Big Thompson Canyon, it's because that place is calling us. <laughs> it's it's two-way. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's this kind of mirroring, there's this kind of love affair. And it's interesting, I'm finding more and more students too, 
they're, they're, people used to look at me like I was kinky or something when I would talk about a love affair with nature. No longer. I find more and more students are, are really resonating with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's more and more students who, who uh, they find that people are wonderful, but people aren't the be all and end all. And they, they find that there is this deeper kind of communion this deeper kind of passion that they feel in the natural world. And so it's been very fascinating to see how uh, the young people are changing and kind of what's in store for us as a culture. And yet when we have that mirror experience with Jesus or Buddha or whoever, we can also see that in each other if we open deeply enough. We yes. can see that in others. We can see that Christ and ourselves, our true selves, in other people as well. And that brings us together. Which is ultimately what we want. That's ultimate, the ultimate kind of mirroring, isn't it? Yeah, it's the application <laughs> of yeah. the experience of the mystical experience that's and right that's right so that each of us that's why it's so important how we treat each other yeah. because we become mirrors for one another and and we need to treat each other as holy and as you know as sacred and realize that unkind words and um, negative actions really affect one another because we're all we're sensitive there's a sensitivity in us so we need to take this, the mirroring seriously and realize we're here to draw out the best in each other. To draw, out. it's one of the one of the things I experience in nature is in the silence is kind of a listening. It's like the divine is there listening, and you know how when someone really listens to you, you mm -hmm. awaken to a power you never knew that you had. Mm -hmm. That's what I experience in the natural world. I feel so thoroughly listened to that all this creativity comes to birth. So if that happens there, we know that that happens with one another when we really listen to each other. It's just easier in nature because nature doesn't push our buttons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Even even if you even if a storm comes up, and I mean I've had accidents in nature, and yet I still feel there's a kind of love there, even when it, even when nature wants seems to be wanting to destroy me. Mm. <laughs> there's still a kind of a love on a deeper level but yeah you're right with with one another we, we push well it's not other. personal <laughs> that's right yeah that's right well you're right we, we push each other's buttons and so mm -hmm. it's important to withdraw to solitude to get some perspective and then see you know see each other who they are in their core uh muir talked about this a lot he said he often felt closest to his friends when he was away from them in nature and I think it's because he got in touch with their core essence. Yes. And sometimes our core essence in the midst of the, chemi the various chemistries we have with each other and, and everything, and, and then we have maybe some challenges with each other. Um, in nature, we get in touch with the core essence of those we love. And then we're, we able, are able to come home and treat them with a new respect because we've seen them in their, their true nature. Mm -hmm. uh, so... Yeah, Muir talked about how he felt he didn't feel lonely usually, but felt this this communion with all things. He felt a communion with all of his friends. And I talk about this in my book, The Contemplative John Muir. I have a chapter about that friendship and solitude and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so we come back to one another better and, and more ready to see the good in each other. Um, and I, I think of a person like Jesus, I mean, so Jesus had to go every morning to be alone uh, in the hills before he did his work for the day. So if Jesus had to go be alone in the natural world every day, oh, do we think that, that we won't have to? <laughs> so it was kind of this rhythm in his life, you know, mornings in solitude, then afternoons in ministry, and then maybe he'd retire with the disciples in the boat or whatever, you know, and have some time with them. But um, so I think that rhythm back and forth between nature and society, nature and society um, is a, a healthy thing. And between solitude and com 
yeah. the community, of yeah. whether, whether the solitude is in nature or, you know, in your house, uh, that solitude, I think, is yeah. the, more important to some people than others, but I've always felt, I've always found it important. I agree. Did you ever have um, encounters, you know, like dangerous encounters with, animals like grizzlies or anything like that yes uh one of them was at night backpacking in the tetons and there was snow all around and i was just on kind of one bare patch that was sort of surrounded by you know acres of snow so in the middle of the night i hear this i smell this musky smell and I and I hear this threatening noise, and I see the side of my vestibule right near my tent sort of push push in, and I hear this kind of threatening noise, and then I I'm you know how it is you wake out of a deep sleep and you don't know what's going on, uh, and they always teach you to be aware of bears, but I wasn't prepared for this, so then um, in the dark I saw the tent push in. Uh, you know, uh, so I'm up at the head and, and I'm looking toward my feet. The tent pushes in and it's like something's trying to enter. So instinctively I punch it. Ah. And it was a bit sharp, but not too bad. But I, was, I wasn't sure what it was. So I turned my headlamp on and I went outside and it was a porcupine. Oh. <laughs> the, porcupine the porcupine had eaten through the side of the tent oh. and eaten the top of my hat because what they're after is salt. They're desperate for salt when they first come out of, you know, when they first come out in the spring. Uh, and, and so it was a porcupine and he started to charge me, but I got my trekking pole and <clears throat> shoved it toward him. But I've had that happen before. Other times I, uh, last two years ago, I had a porcupine uh, eat my, some of my pack that I had in the tree uh, at night. Mm. But uh, yes, I, I've had some uh, bear encounters, too, um, and those are quite interesting. But, yeah, they're, they're, but something happens to you, I think, in some of those encounters is that some of the qualities of the animal rub off on you. Mm -hmm. And I felt like, okay, I can defend myself more when the, it's like the porcupine's energy got transferred to me. Mm -hmm. There's that mirroring. Same happened with the bear. I felt more uh, solid and, and um, uh, able to act in my vision when I had an encounter with the bear. Hmm. Yes. Well, I guess our time is about up, huh? Yeah, it is. It's 8.30. Thank you so much. That was just great. You're so welcome. It's a very beautiful presentation. Thank you. You're very welcome. So now we can all go out into whatever natural area we have and uh, feel inspired. Definitely. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. You're thank welcome. You. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Everybody have a good night. Thank you. Good night.